So what we'd like to do today is first give a bit of an introduction to eye tracking um, as a method. So how does it work? What do eye trackers look like? What kind of data do we get from it? Um, what kind of participants can we get? And how does it, yeah, just generally, how does it work? Um, and then we'll show you and we'll give you two um, different data sets. Um, so simulated data sets for you to work with and to, um, yeah, have a little hands-on experience uh, with, yeah, with simulated eye tracking um, data. And then you can wrangle that and visualize that. And that will be the, the practical part in R. Right, so first of all, what's the basic idea of eye tracking? So um, the idea behind it is called the eye mind hypothesis or assumption. And that says that what you look at at any given moment is likely also what you're thinking about at that moment. And a second important point is that is this idea that time is related to processing effort. So if it takes you longer to process something, that likely means that it's more difficult for you to process that for, for whatever reason. So what that means is that eye tracking is um, an online measure of processing difficulty. So it's, it's an online measure because it's measuring um, processing while processing is happening. So while you are reading something or while you are looking at a picture and so on. So it's measuring um, your subconscious processes while they are happening. The opposite would be offline. So offline would be something like having people read a sentence and then afterwards asking them a question about the sentence or something like that. Um, yeah, and it's, uh, I wrote there that it has a high temporal resolution. Um, so what that means is that it's it's basically just very fast, right? So we can see um, very quickly what is happening while people are reading um, something or looking at a picture. Okay, so here's a here's an example. So if you already know this example, um, yeah, just bear with me. But um, say you have a sentence that starts with the old man. So just for yourself, you can now think about how, do, how would I expect that sentence to continue? So the old man, how would I expect that to continue? And then let's all read this next sentence that also starts with the old man. And this is, for most people, that's not, that's a weird sentence to process. Um, so for yourself, you can again think about, so what happened when you read this sentence? Why do you think that happened? Did you get stuck on any words? So did you kind of stop at any point and go back or was something confusing about that sentence? So this is a sentence that's often called um, or that's typically called a garden path sentence. So when you start reading this, you would interpret that as old is an adjective that refers to man, which is a noun, so the old man. Um, and then you get to the, and suddenly your interpretation doesn't work anymore. Um, so what most people will do is they will go back to the start of the sentence um, and try to reinterpret that. And the uh, interpretation that works here is that old is actually a noun, so for old person. Um, and man is actually a verb. So that's not the most frequent use of these words. Um, so this is why we can say this, this sentence kind of leads you down the garden path. That's where the name comes from. Um, so you interpret it one way and then you realize this can't be right and you have to go back and update your interpretation. And this is a nice um, example for eye tracking because if you had an eye tracker, you could see that people uh, would stop at the. So the old man is still fine in the old interpretation, but then once you get to the, people realize this isn't correct. So that's when they stop, and then that's also very often when they jump back to the beginning of the sentence. Okay, so to get a bit more technical, um, how do eye trackers work? So um, you have a camera, so it, if you look at the left picture, the camera is on the left. So this round lens that you can see. So this camera is filming uh, one of your eyes. It's often just one eye, um, which is fine because there are studies that um, show that the other eye does largely the same thing for most people. So we just film one eye and that's okay. 
and we have an infrared light which is on the right in the in that left picture so that's this um, square shaped thing with the little red dots so that sends an infrared light towards your eye and the eye is being filmed um, and then on the right you can see what that looks like so this shows the pupil which is green and then it also shows a thing called the corneal reflection which is this red dot so um, the corneal reflection, that's just where the light from the cornea um, is reflected. So the eye tracker uses those two things. So it uses the center of the pupil and it uses the corneal reflection. And then it looks at the difference. So it kind of draws a line between the center of the pupil and the corneal reflection. You can see that in, this, in these examples on the right and using kind of the length of the line and the direction of that line where, where it's pointing to, um, we can get an idea of where, or we can actually, the eye tracker actually calculates the position of the gaze, so where a person is looking at. Okay, um, any questions so far before we move on to the systems? Uh, no questions yet. Okay, great. So I think that Divya is going to um, introduce the systems we have. Yeah. So there are three main systems um, that can be used for eye tracking. Um, one is what um, Yuli already showed you, which is on a table and um, connected to a laptop or a computer, and you're sitting somewhere looking at this, um, looking at the screen, and the eye tracker is placed below the screen. And then you have these eye tracking glasses, um, the image you see under here, but also the kind of image that was um, the thumbnail for this workshop, um, where you can just wear the glasses. And then there's an in-between mobile solution, which um, you can kind of carry with you, um, which gives you some flexibility in terms of where you're conducting your experiment, but you still need a laptop or a computer connected to it, and you're still like doing it on a screen. So we're just going to look at those um, on the following slide. So this example is my setup. Um, this was in a Faraday case. So what you see to the left are um, batteries for EEG caps. Um, and if you look at the computer screen, uh, you see this small, elongated, thin, slim, beautiful device there. Um, that's the SMI tracker. SMI has shut since, but that's the SMI tracker. Works on the same principle um, that Yulia explained, but it takes both eyes into consideration. So you can actually choose if you want to take data from the left or the right eye. Um, and that's offline. So it collects data from both the eyes and then you can choose. It also has some mechanisms whereby it corrects. So if um, the eyes don't exactly collaborate on something, it used to correct. Um, for um, yeah, certain errors. Um, it also had a better um, tolerance to head movements because if you know your eyes move in, um, I don't know if you can see my video as well, but just because your eyes are moving does not mean your head isn't moving with it. So your eyes moving independently without your head moving and your eyes moving along with your head moving is something that needs to be accounted for. Um, that gets even more difficult uh, in the glasses. Okay. Um, oh, but sorry. On the desktop, this can be fixed with the chin rest. Um, this is Yulia's system. Um, and the chin rest can really fix the problem and um, make sure that your head isn't moving too much, which gives you a much better and a lot more accurate um, measurement of just the eyes. And when you move on to the glasses, um your head moves with the eye um which is yeah great <laughs> but um you don't have a screen so when um in a desktop eye tracker the eye tracker is just below your screen so it knows what you're looking at it may um, lose your eyes if you look at the ceiling for example but it won't lose your eyes where as long as you're within the screen um, but with the glasses, you have the potential of looking anywhere in the room, which is great because your head's moving with it and your cameras are going with your eyes wherever they're going. Um, but it doesn't really provide a surface of where you're looking 
So if you think in terms of temporal and spatial resolution, there is like great temporal resolution and spatial resolution in both where, uh, in the desktop eye trackers. But in the glasses, your spatial resolution gets a bit more fuzzy. Um, you know you're looking left or right, but you don't exactly know the surface that it's on. Um, Yulia, anything you want to add to that? Um, no, I think you covered uh, pretty much everything. <laughs> um, okay, so some considerations. Um, yeah, practicality. For the rest of your participants have to travel to the lab and mobile setups can be done anywhere. Um, your, um, the mobile setups may feel more natural, but they do come with um, more problems in how clean the data is and more problems in, um, um, yeah, like I said, uh, what you're looking at, AOIs, or we'll come to that in a few slides, but they're not as defined. Um, you can't exactly pinpoint if they were looking at, like in Yulia's example, if you just show a sentence versus um, the scene in a room and you're actually moving around in a room, you don't know if you're looking at this particular book or the book next to it, if you're looking at a bookshelf, for example. So it's not as precise and it needs to be like corrected offline a lot. Um, yeah, but of course, if you're on a computer screen, how you look at more naturalistic tasks, even reading something that is so naturalistic, um, may be different the way it is in an experiment than in a natural setting. Um, eye tracking, uh, uh, sampling is measured in hertz, um, which is how many pictures the camera takes per second. So if you have, um, say, a thousand hertz camera, which means it takes a thousand pictures a second, or if you have like 250, then it takes 250 images a second. Um, and most most cameras and most hardware come with some kind of a correcting, uh, correcting algorithm within it as well. So the raw data that you get is not as bad or as raw um, on at least desktop systems. So it is corrected to some extent, um, and you can have had mostly reliable data. Okay. Um, both of us are clearly fans of eye tracking. <laughs> we use it all the time. So uh, yeah, it's really versatile. Um, Yulia has been using it in reading tasks, so literary studies. Um, I've been using it in more. Ah, uh, not really literary studies. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> linguistics. linguistics. <laughs> uh, but yes, reading. Yeah. Um, I've been using it in cognitive tasks. I've been using it with children and adolescents, um, and in clinical psychology. So more cognitive tasks, but also more ecologically valid-ish tasks. Um, and so I've been using it in visual search, previewing, scene perception. Um, but you can also use it in more cognitive tasks like NBAC or go no go or uh, CPT. Um, just normal cognitive tools get a lot um, richer in data if you combine it with something other than just behavioral data, so other than just key press data. And we'll see examples of that in a few slides. Um, and of course, communication between users and computer systems. And then you can apply it not just in linguistics and clinical psychology like we have, but also consumer psychology. So um, if you went into a supermarket and chose between three different cereals, uh, what did you look at the packaging? Um, what did you look at to be able to make that choice? It's also used a lot in expertise and training, for example, flight simulations or um, yeah, training in general, how do experts do something and how do novices do something? And then um, maybe Sarah can say something about this uh, with math and um, reading in school children as well. Um, so yeah, those are the kind of trainings um, it's used for. And so basically it's really versatile and I particularly enjoy it because I work with children and it makes working with children um, a lot easier than what I did earlier, which was EG. <laughs> um, <laughs> And with clinical populations, so uh, a lot of my um, participants had ADHD or autism, and it was never an issue um, to sit there and do an eye tracking study for an hour or so. Um, and so, yeah, it's pretty versatile, and you can use it for a lot of different things. 
I had one question. Sure. Um, are you familiar, can people use this in fMRI um, as part of a study? I think I've seen some um, eye tracking fMRI studies, definitely. Okay. The distance that the hardware would have to be away from the MRI, that was the yeah. only reason I was yeah. kind of wondering. So um, eye tracking and EEG is really common. In fact, you even get these integrated eye trackers like the glasses with electrodes. So you can put the electrodes on and you can wear the glasses. Um, yeah. And that's getting pretty common. Um, I have seen studies that used um, fMRI and eye tracking. So I assume there is some way to integrate it. All right. Um, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm this. Um, yeah, so advantages are that it has really, really good temporal resolution, um, but even better spatial resolution compared to, um, yeah, some of the <laughs> um, other stuff like, say, EG. Um, it's not invasive at all. Um, it has, it's an online measure of processing. Um, it's fairly natural, so you can use the glasses, but even if you're using the desktop version, you can make the task really versatile, um, which you can in other systems like EEG and fMRI, you are restricting movement a lot, so you can't um, have really versatile tasks there. Um, yeah, and no other task is needed. Disadvantages are integrating with behavioral data. This was a pain throughout my PhD because if you're trying to integrate key presses which are collected on a different software with your eye tracking software, you could send triggers, which is again how I solved it. Um, but the trigger will just tell you, for example, when an event happened, like the start of a trial, um, but it may not always integrate the different systems. Um, so if you have, uh, for example, um, EEG and eye tracking in the same system, so one um, company made both and provided it as a solution, then they would have thought of everything, hopefully. Um, but if you decide to use two different systems, so if you have an existing EEG system and you have an existing behavioral system, and then you decide to add eye tracking to it, and these are three different systems, um, <laughs> it can get really messy. Um, subjectivity of AOIs, um, there are different ways. Uh, so AOIs are areas of interest. Um, there are different ways you can define this. You can just take your screen and turn it into grids and say, I take every data point in grid one, two, three, four. But this doesn't really make sense because if you're showing an image, for example, um, so if you're seeing my face, my face and my background, if you just turn this into a grid, it wouldn't make sense to take this grid and this grid as two separate grids and feed them equally. Um, and then if you marked my face, that would also not be a very good AOI or not a perfect AOI because you could be looking at my eyes, but maybe looking somewhere beyond, but still see my eyes. So, you know, what are you exactly seeing and how narrow it is and how wide do you want it to be? So there's a lot of uh, debate that goes into it. Um, and finally, the definition of a fixation and a saccade, we'll come to that in a minute as well. But a fixation is basically when your eye is looking at something. And the saccade is the movement from one fixation to another. So you're looking at point A and then you're looking at point B and this is fixation A, fixation B and the saccade is what's connecting the two. Um, but like we'll see in a minute, the eye is never completely stable. So it makes these micro saccades, um, which makes the definition of what is a fixation and when should you define something as a fixation um, also something you need to define during your analysis. So you could take absolute raw data and then define what you want as a fixation or if you're using a software, then you could tell the software to define it. Um, but yeah, there's some amount of um, discussion that needs to go into a fixation circuit definition before you start analyzing your data. Yep. Any questions still here? Oh, yeah. I don't see any questions yet. Um, uh -huh. You just sent around a link to a paper about eye tracking and fMRI together. So. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay, so if there are no questions right now, um, we thought we'd um, share a little bit of what um, our experimental setups looked like or what they could look like. So in a reading experiment, you usually, or probably in, in all kinds of eye tracking experiments, you want to check if your eye tracker is actually doing everything correctly, if it is kind of catching the pupil and the reflection or if something's going wrong. So this is a step that um, is called calibration and validation. One sec, switch off the sound. Okay, can you see the, the YouTube tab that I have open now or do I have to share no. it again? It, you see it? No. Oh, I have to share it again. Okay, one sec. Um, okay. How about now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. So what you'll see um, in a second is, so this is the um, participants view. So they're just starting the experiment. You see the eye tracker, you see the camera and the light um, at the bottom of the screen. And the participant is asked to just, so to always focus on the dots that are on the screen. So I'll just play this video. Sorry about the weird, you know, um, effects when you're filming a screen, but. All right, so what you could see is that the participant was um, focusing on these points and then the second part here, the second screen, this is what the experimenter sees. So here we can see um, how close um, the tracking is to the actual point on the screen. So we want to make sure that this is um, very close to it, just, just as a check to make sure that everything's working okay. Um, and the eye tracker gives you um, these little numbers that show you how far away um, the tracking is compared to the actual point. Um, and if that's close enough, then you can proceed with the, with the experiment. And then throughout the experiment, so in a reading experiment, you typically have, um, you also check that people are actually reading attentively. So you often have, have them read a sentence or two or three, and then you ask a question um, and they have to press a button to answer the question, either yes or no. Um, and then later you can use that to, um, for example, if they answered no on, or sorry, if they, if they gave the wrong answer on 90% of your sentences, then maybe they weren't really um, paying attention. Um, so this is a way to maybe get rid of some, some data um, if it's clear that the participant wasn't really reading or wasn't really understanding um, the sentences. And what you will also often do um, is, so you will show them the sentence, they read the sentence, they answer the question, and then you do a little, um, what's called um, a drift correct, which is they see one dot um, on the screen, typically um, top left, if you're reading from left to right, and they have to focus on that and also press a button. And this is just a quick check in between every, um, every stimulus, every sentence, to make sure that the tracking is still working okay. Yeah, so do you, have, um, do you want to share how, yeah, what the setup is in your experiments? Yeah, so calibration validation um, works quite similar. Five point, I think, I haven't collected data for really long, but I think it was the five point <laughs> calibration and a four point validation. Mm -hmm. um, similar setup. Um, we did have, so because it wasn't reading and there were different tasks, um, none of the tasks were more than 10 minutes. And each trial was pretty long, actually, seven to nine seconds, depending on um, the task. Um, and I had a fixation cross in between. So we had a fixation cross to the left outside the stimulus area. Um, and then they would have to start at that cross and then come back to the stimulus when the stimulus comes on. Um, so we kind of had a drift correction, but we didn't call it that because um, mm -hmm. we didn't actually check for it only online. So there was an experimenter sitting outside making sure they actually do look at it. Um, and if they didn't, then we would keep reminding them to be like, don't forget to look at the cross, don't forget to look at the cross, so we always <laughs> had like the correct starting point. Um, and question, and oh, but we didn't have a feed, yeah, different task, so mostly there was a response instead of a feedback. Um, and Kyla, you had something? Yeah, did you, did you see the question in the... I saw there was a question, yes. Yeah, so there's, so Sarah asks if you have any advice specifically for calibration with children with disabilities that 
would affect their eye contact like autism spectrum disorder or if even the best eye trackers will only be able to detect when their gaze is on or off the screen. Oh, um, could you elaborate on um, difficulties? Why would autism have difficulties looking on screen? Yeah, so especially with young children, uh, when, they're, when their social emotional development is still occurring, yeah. often young children who are still building those social emotional connections aren't going to have the typical eye contact human to human and even later in life they might not build that if they're really low functioning on the autism spectrum or um and then for language development too they might not know which areas of a passage to focus on or seeing an image they might not latch on to the core information that you want them to get out of an image oh that's okay um so i work with autism not with very young children though they were at least 10 um and high functioning, so I don't think that's comparable. Um, but uh, for calibration, there was usually yeah, no major problems, even if they um, had trouble understanding how to follow the dot, they usually got the point of it. It needed some more practice. Sometimes we had to redo calibration a few times. Sometimes we just had to like have this trial ppt where we don't actually record the calibration but we just make them um, practice following a dot so we would just do that before we start the actual calibration um and then it worked um it helps to just keep reminding them for if you have a drift check or something to be like don't forget to look at the center of the screen don't forget to look at the left of the screen wherever you need them to start um, and if they don't look at, say, in a free viewing experiment with four people on the screen, they don't look at, um, you know, people, but background objects or paintings or, um, yeah, something completely different. I, that's the data you want, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, that's been my experience with higher functioning kids. But then yeah. when we want to see like how really lower functioning kids are engaging with our task, then it yeah. just becomes so difficult because we just can't get the data. We just uh, have to yeah. know like eye tracker could not calibrate. Oh, um, so later I, uh, we have a list of packages and one of them, I'm just going to um, look it up real quick, but one of them um, I saw at this uh, conference last year that I thought you went to, um, does cleaning with infant data and maybe that is something that works for you. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. That's the ECEM Alicante conference? Yeah, yeah exactly. Got it. Thank you. Um, I either last year or two years ago, um, it's a really good conference for methodology. Um, I think it was eye tracking, you know, eye tracking, eye. Um, maybe face path. Um, I can look it up and um, get back to you on which package it was because it was a really impressive package on cleaning infant data. Um, and it used the same procedure as um, an EEG. So it interpolates, it takes like uh, adjoining data points and then it interpolates data in between. Nice. Um, and so if you have in, like if you have a lot of missing data, then it tells you, okay, this part of um, the data is like completely not usable, but this part I could interpolate and make it work better for you. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was a handy package and it's an R. <laughs> oh good, that could be really useful. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, DVI, yeah. I have a question too. Yeah. Uh, do they use eye tracking for um, for people with ADHA? Um, is it related something? No. Yeah, I, I well, eye tracking is used in um, a lot of different research, um, including ADHD. That was my research, but it's more um, for finding like my research was more for looking at biomarkers. Um, for ADHD, I don't know if you do you mean like in therapy and stuff. I mean attention disorder. People cannot focus uh, and, and concentrate and. But do things. you do you mean for diagnosis or for therapy? Uh, both. I mean I don't know. <laughs> uh, therapy, not really. Um, there are some diagnostic tools or some tools that came claim to be diagnostic. Um, and. Yeah, but they're not used that often. And um, I would say the biomarker research is still like getting there. Um, mm -hmm. In the near future, maybe for diagnostics, for therapy, I still don't think so. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. good. Thanks. <laughs> okay. okay, should we move on to the next slide? Yeah. 
Sorry, I think there's another question. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, I can't see oh. anything. <laughs> but just about the complete package names, is that coming later in the talk? Uh, yeah. yeah, we have that later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, just to give you an idea of what you're actually or what you would see as the person doing um, the, the experiment. So this is, um, this will differ depending on which eye tracker you work with um, and which software and things like that. Um, but this is what it would look like for you. So you can see which eye is being tracked. You again have the pupil and the reflection. You can change the sample rates. Um, you can change the illumination. Um, yeah, to help you get reliable tracking. And I wanted to show you um, a video. Some of you, I mean, if you've already worked with eye tracking, this will be very familiar. But this is just a quick video that shows um, how we read. So let me just open that. Uh, yeah, so what you could see there is that when we read, we actually make these little jumps. So it's not really a smooth um, movement, but we jump from one word to the next, or typically we even jump um, a few words. So we would, so it's very common that some words are skipped, right? So you don't look at every single word, but you look at a word, then you skip the next one or two words. If they're shorter, you might skip three words even. Um, and then you fixate, so you look at the next word, and it's really those little um, jumps. Okay, so here's an example of a reading experiment, and um, this is also what the quote unquote data will be on. So the simulated data that we'll give you um, later that you can work with, um, this will be yeah, pretending that we did this experiment and we got some data out of it. So um, this is a reading experiment that looks at um, gender stereotypes. So you would have people read sentences like, the doctor enjoyed his day off, the nurse liked her new shoes. So you would always have a role noun, doctor or nurse, um, and one of these is stereotypically male, the other one is stereotypically female. And then you have a pronoun, his or her, um, and they can either match um, the stereotype. So this is what I'm calling the congruent condition. So that just means it matches the stereotype. So doctor, his, nurse, her, um, or the incongruent condition, which is when the pronoun doesn't match um, the stereotype. So for this experiment, we would mainly analyze how people behave when they get to the pronouns. So when they get to his and her, and we would compare those two conditions and see how they react. So our um, area of interest would be the pronouns. Um, by the way, so we can call them areas of interest, regions of interest, interest areas. So any of these um, abbreviations are common, so they all mean really the same thing. And in um, reading experiments like these, where it's a very deliberate design and setup, the interest areas are usually determined by the design. So we know that we're interested in, we expect something to happen um, on the pronouns. Um, so we know what we're looking at, but there are also um, procedures to find um, areas of interest. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with this image, um, but most eye tracking conferences will show this image like once a day. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the previewing task that um, started it all. Um, basically, the ones who've never seen this before, can you reflect a bit on what's the first thing you saw here? Um, and yeah, just what do you think your eyes did when you looked at this picture? And this is just previewing. So I, basically in a previewing task, we just show you images and let you look at them. <laughs> no instructions. So I was led light. So the woman who opens the door because it's the contrast thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah. yeah. So previewing experiments tell us these kind of, uh, sorry, anyone else saying anything, writing anything? 
Uh, Sarah said she first looked at the leftmost man. Yeah. Yeah, so um, these kind of um, previewing experiments tell us, um, give us algorithms on saliency, for example, or what were the elements that stood out in, like Sarah said, in contrast, um, or what, where do we look when we get to see anything? So you would probably first look at the center of the screen as well, or the center of the screen like because of your peripheral vision, you can see a lot, and then you choose something to focus at on. Um, and first lady, yeah, exactly. So, um, and then if you think a little more, if you looked at the man first, then you, I'm guessing, next looked at where the man was looking. Um, and this is what we call joint attention, which is something you can also study with previewing. So I look at you, and if you are not looking at me, but at something else, then I will then follow your gaze to look at that something else. Um, so that's something you can gather from such an experiment as well. Um, if you're studying, if you're looking at autism, you can see um, social versus non-social stimulus. If you're looking um, at art, you can see art expertise versus non-art experts. Um, you can, but with the free viewing, you can study things like saliency, but you can also study things like scan path. So a scan path is um, these fixations and saccade, all of it together form a pattern. So you have fixation one, saccade one, fixation two, saccade two, fixation three, saccade three, um, and all of this together forms what is your eye movement pattern for this image. And that tells us a lot as well. For example, where did you look after you looked at the man? Did you follow his gaze or not? Um, or what were the most salient event? Uh, um, yeah, most salient um, objects here. Was it just the contrast? Was it maybe in this? Um, I mean, if there was like a death metal poster back there, um, that wouldn't fit in the painting. So even if it wasn't in the center, even if it wasn't salient, you may look at it because it's novel. Um, so yeah, those are the kind of things you can learn from a previewing experiment. That's one kind of um, scene viewing that you can do. Um, if you worked with um, clinical data, then you probably know the embedded figures task. Um, you need to find this triangle. Uh, you can't see my arrow. Uh, my cursor. Um, you need to find the triangle in the carriage in the tram. Can you find it? Just raise your hands or yeah, no, whatever, if you found it. What do you mean the triangle? There are many. There's a sort of so you mean to count them down or whatever? No, there's just one triangle that exactly fits. So the triangle ah. above. Uh. Um Julia, could you point? <laughs> Yeah, to to the one in the yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. can you see my mouse? Yeah. Yeah. So this one. Yeah. Unless, uh, yeah, unless yeah, I fail sure. this test. <laughs> okay. It's it's really difficult. Um, I mean, embedded figures is not an easy task. <laughs> I struggle with it definitely. Um, but yeah, it's to find this one object in a bigger um, constellation of objects. So it's like this just all processing. So. You know, you have a hole and then you have one part of it. Can you find the part in the hole? Um, these are like cognitive tasks that normally just use a key press. So an embedded figures task without eye tracking would just be, oh, just what I did with you. Say yes as soon as you found it. Um, or in an experimental setup, press a key as soon as you found it. Um, but with eye tracking, we can actually see where you looked, where you failed to look. Um, did you actually go over the triangle and not see it? Um, and don't worry, if you did any of these things, it doesn't mean you have like a pathological problem or something. It's just perception um, and what you paid attention to, what you perceive, what you don't perceive. Um, and these kind of tasks tell you more about just processing styles of different people. And then of course you can correlate it to different things and stuff. Um, but yeah, so that's one kind of embedded figures. And the next one is even more difficult. <laughs> Can you find the cube in uh, the figure marked A? So I can give you a hint. The front of this rectangle is 
somewhere yellow. <laughs> do you see it? Do you see it? I I think I have it. Should I point it out? Yeah. Okay, so it starts yeah, here and exactly. and here and back. Yeah. yeah. But this one is hard. Wow. This one is really hard. <laughs> Um, every time I showed this in uh, a talk, I need to first make sure I absolutely know where it is before I put it on a slide. Um, yeah, so these kind of tasks that are actually normal cognitive tasks used for just a variety of things. Um, even the, the, the ray figure, which is just a drawing task, so one of my tasks was a drawing. Um, just normal things where in a drawing task you would just look at qualitative data ideally you would just be like oh which line did you start drawing with um, did you start drawing the house first or the mountains first and things like that um, you can find out a lot more with eye tracking you can find out a lot more about how you organize spatial information um, before you started drawing after you started drawing um, so there's like a host of things you can do with it um, any Questions with the experimental setup or with the tasks that we've used or kind of tasks. Um, so now I think I'm coming to uh, my data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is um, this is actually my data, like my participant data. But you're going to get a simulated version of this data today, a very very narrow simulated <laughs> version. Um, but here, what you can see is to the left. Um, these are four participants at once. Um, or yeah, three participants. Um, and to the left here, these big circles, okay, sorry, go back a bit. The circles are fixations, the lines are saccades. Um, the bigger the circle, the larger the fixation duration. So big circles, you looked longer, small circles, you looked not as long. Um, and the lines just show you the process from moving from one circle to another, so from one fixation to another. And so in, to the left, you have these three big circles. That's where the fixation or the drift correct, whatever was. Um, but that's where we started. So we made sure that the participants know you have to start to the left. And then the stimulus came on. This is a um, visual search task with words. So you have a target word um, or a cue right at the top. Um, I'm not sure which, what that word is. I guess it's Ponta or something. Um, these were pseudo Portuguese, well, Portuguese, but yeah, pseudo Portuguese words with um, their pseudo meanings in German, um, since everyone was native German speaker. Um, and they had to find the meaning of this word and click, um, press the corresponding key. So the response pad was also a grid with four by three keys. And once you found the correct response, you had to press the correct response key corresponding to the cell. And so you see um, the lines moving up to the target word, being like, oh, that's the word I need to look for, and then come down to the grid and be like, oh, this isn't the word, this isn't the word, this isn't the word. And even there, you can see these strategies. Like most people look at just the left word um, because that's the word you need to look for. You don't need to look for the translation right away if it's not the correct word. Or they look at the center, which is just like, oh, I can see all the words here and it's done. Um, so yeah, the, this is a scan path and you can also in more advanced levels do scan path analysis. So something that I did was recurrences. Um, if you looked at word one, did you come back to look at the same word again? And if you did, how far away was this in time? Um, how often did you come back to it? Was this a target word or a response word that you came back to? Or did you also have to come back to like other words? Um, these are the kind of analysis that you can then do with it. Um, and we now have two videos. Mm -hmm. um, that's just one participant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So you see they start to the left. Um, they go up there, up down, and that's where they found the word. They go back to check for it. That's it. Yeah. Um, and now in this one participant, you can already see if you had to clean this data. Um, you want to go from the fixation to the left, right up to the target word. If they've already spent too much time looking at the grid, then they have a kind of advantage. So we don't want that to happen, you know? So that's something, for example, you would like to clean out. Or if they've already um, gone to look at the word um, too soon before the stimulus came out, then you need to control for that as well. 
Um, so these are the kind of things you need to think about while cleaning the data because then it's just, yeah, you can run your models eventually. Uh, no, this is a typical participant. This is like a 10, 11 year old participant. Uh, yeah. Um, and the uh, other one? Yeah. I am not sure which group they were from. Sorry. These are three, four participants. And here you can see the variability in their scan parts. So all of them arrive at the solution. Um, but yeah, later, sooner or later, um, they take different paths to get to the solution. And this is where you can see like individual variability. And this is just individual variability. You can see like intra-individual variability across trials. You can see individual variability across participants in the same trial. You can see group level variability if you look at ADHD, autism, and typically developing kids. So you have like these different levels of variability that you can see just on these beautiful colored uh, circles and lines. <laughs> yeah. So I think there was another question as well. Okay. No, should we go on? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, so what kind of data can you get from eye trackers then? Um, we've already spoken about fixations and sakes. These are the circles and then the lines connecting them. Um, and of course they complement each other and together they can form these scan path analysis. So then you can analyze if you went back in time to look at something, um, what were the relationships between uh, looking at the target, looking at the object or in case of tree viewing, like the man, and then you look at what the man was looking at. Um, so these kind of relationships can be deciphered really well as well. Then we have microsaccades, um, which we discussed because the eye is never still. So even if you have just a fixation task, so if you just have a cross on the screen and you're like for the next 10 seconds, I just want you to stare at this cross and do nothing else, you would find what are microsaccades. So the eye wouldn't be still, but would just be like, moving around <laughs> um, and this would be, this is actually like your raw data. So if you asked your eye tracker not to um, give you fixations and saccades, it would just give you um, like in say a 250 Hertz eye tracker, the 250 data points it collected per second. And it could just give you this. It could just give you X, Y coordinates of um, like X, Y coordinates with spatial data temporarily over like each second. And these would be your microsaccades. Um, yeah. um, regressions are what Yulia already explained when you go back to a word. So um, the man, the man, the boat, was that the example? Uh, the old man, the, the old boat. Man, the yeah. boat. Mm -hmm. um, at which point with the, when you go back to the old man, that would be a regression. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe just to yeah. add for regressions mm -hmm. in, in reading, what we're typically interested in for regressions in reading is how long they are, because you also get a really short regression if you um, jump a little bit too far. So as we've seen with this little video is that when we read, we jump from words to words and then we skip a few words in between and sometimes we jump a little bit too far and then we have to go back a little bit. But that doesn't mean that we had a processing difficulty. It just meant that we kind of, it's called an overshoot, so that we just went a little bit too far. And then we make a small regression back, but that doesn't mean that it was hard to read. So we're looking at the long, or how long the regressions are. So the, um, yeah, length of the regressions is also what's going to be in, in the example data in a minute. Yeah, um, also to add to regressions, um, mm -hmm. if you don't look at um, visual scenes, but more traditional eye tracking tasks, which are like pro-saccade and anti-saccade, which means um, you look at the center and then um, you see an object to the left and then you have to look at the object to the left or then you have to look at the object to the right. So it's just, um, there's a black screen, a white fixation in the center, the white fixation goes away and then you have a ball to the left and then you have to look at the ball. Or in an anti saccade task, you have to look away from the ball. Um, so these could have regressions or well, undershoots and overshoots as well as well as smooth pursuit, which is um, used for schizophrenia research a lot. Um, and it's actually a pretty good marker for schizophrenia, um, where you may have 
like if you imagine a bird flying and you're watching the bird fly over, that's a smooth pursuit eye movement. So you're just following a moving target. Um, and if I had a ball on the screen, which was moving like that, and you had to just follow the ball, if you could predict where the ball is going, you could overshoot and, you know, move your eye to the position the ball would be in a few milliseconds. Um, and that would again be an overshoot. So you can measure these in biomarkers as well. And then we have pupil dilation. Um, so our pupil dilates um, as a reaction to light, but it also dilates as a reaction to working memory load. So if tasks get difficult, um, your pupil will dilate. Um, if you, yeah, so a lot of tasks would just, um, kind of manipulate um, working memory load or just like effort that takes you to do something. And then you can measure pupil dilation in this, with respect to this manipulation. And blinks, um, also few, I have to say pupil dilation and blinks are just data you get from the eye tracker anyways, um, even if that's not your principal concern. So if you wanna play around with it and look at it, give it a shot especially with blinks um, and um, clinical populations, there's a lot of literature with blinks being related to dopamine systems. Um, and so if that's something you're interested in or if you're working with um, dopamine related disorders like ADHD, then maybe blinks are something that you wanna look at. Yeah. Yeah, and of course they're not as categorical as may seem. We already discussed that with fixation saccades and microsaccades, but also with um, regressions, for example, in a smooth pursuit, it's smooth pursuit is not as smooth as it looks in theory. Um, and, and for pupil dilation, you need to like really control everything else. So light and have a baseline and stuff like that. Um, also depending on your eye tracker, like my eye tracker gave every missing data as a blink. <laughs> so be very, very careful. If you have a three second blink, it's not a blink. <laughs> <laughs> or your participant fell asleep either one of them fell asleep. <laughs> yeah 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 um and when you're exporting data from your eye tracker um you could get the raw data which is exactly like x y coordinates across time so just everything it collected um yeah without the classification of a fixation or saccade or you can get event data, which is pre-classified fixations and saccades. So you could tell it, I want it um, if the data was collected in these many pixels across these many milliseconds, then classify it as a fixation. And if you tell it that, then it'll give you something called an event data file, which would have pre-classified um, fixations and saccades. And most softwares will also allow you to mark areas of interest. So there are packages where you could do this offline and you could just be like, okay, these, um, this is my area of interest and everything, all the X, Y coordinates in this area, mark that as face. Or um, if your software, if your eye tracking software already allows you to do that, then it will just allow you to take the stimulus, um, take like a paint tool or uh, a, a rectangle or whatever and actually mark areas of interest and then export this data. So you already have the areas of interest you want in the data. Um, today, because this is like a beginner workshop and we've already spent an hour explaining what eye tracking is and how it goes, um, we're only gonna look at fixation data um, from the two simulations that we've made. Um, but if you're interested in like a more advanced thing, we can look at the kinds of stuff. We can do this for a year if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an example of um, what you might get if you export. So this is um, reading data. This is from an iLink 1000 um, eye tracker. So this will depend based on the eye uh, tracker you use, on the software you use. But just to give you an idea of um, the scale of it, so I'm just scrolling down. This is just a list of what the column names are, so I'm still scrolling. Um, so these are close to 200, I think. Um, so you have a lot of variables. Some of this ha also has to do with um, things like second run or third run. So if people are reading your sentences two or three times, 
many people won't do that, but if they do, this is also collected. Um, and then in the end, so these lowercase variables, these are things that you actually specified in the setup. So the condition, for example, what's the correct answer to the question? Um, so anything that's specific to your experiment will be at the bottom. So you'll get this massive list of close to 200 variables um, and you will want to narrow it down. So what we're giving you today is a, is a already kind of a narrowed down, um, again, simulated data file, which looks um, a little bit like this. So remember the setup I explained on this gender stereotypes reading experiment with um, doctor uh, his or doctor her and so on. Um, and these are a few, just a few columns. So you have the recording session label, that's typically the participants. Um, the trials are counted. So in this case, these are just the sentences. Um, you get information on which I is used. Data file, this is just what the eye tracker calls the file where the information is saved. So this is really kind of a superfluous variable. We don't really need that. Um, then you have the stimulus. So the entire sentence which condition it was in. And then here, this gives you an idea of how this is structured. So interest area label, the doctor, and then we scroll down, enjoyed his, and so on. So every line is um, data for one interest area. And again, in reading an interest area is typically a word. So this is typically pretty, um, yeah, already defined. So we don't really have to worry about that. So you get data for every word and the data that we have in here is uh, first fixation duration. So how long was the first fixation on the? And here you can see that there's a little dot, um, which means that the person didn't look at that word. And then for doctor, you have this number. So this is in milliseconds. Um, then you have the trial fixation count. So this is for the uh, complete trial. So this is for the entire sentence and there were nine fixations um, in the entire sentence, right? So this number doesn't change because it's still, we're still looking at the first sentence. Um, and then the last variable is regression path duration. So this goes back to what I said earlier that we might want to look at regressions and how long they are. So that's why we're looking at regression path duration. You can also, so other variables related to regression are things like just counts. Um, so how many regressions did the person make um, out of that word? Um, but regression path duration is a really common one. And again, we see there are no regressions for the first couple of words, and then here's a regression. Okay, and this is what the data looks like. So you have the first participant. Um, and the important thing is to know that this is word by word, every word on a new line and stimulus that's just for your information what was the entire sentence but the data is word per word okay oh yeah any questions on this before we move on to the other data set and we'll make this available um, in a second so you can work with it so um, oh, I just question. yeah I just saw um, and I've just replied to it. Um, the question on uh, developing an eye tracking study by yourself. So mm -hmm. the book by Klein and Ettinger, um, Klein's actually my supervisor, uh, was my supervisor. Um, and there's a chapter that I've co-authored in the book. So I'm actually kind of happy that somebody uh, put my reference there. Thank you. <laughs> somebody knows what I've written. <laughs> Um, and um, it's a really good book. I'm not just saying that because I have a chapter in it, but it's a really good book um, and it covers a vast variety of things. So the chapter I've co-authored is on typical and atypical development, but they have um, chapters on Bayesian analysis in eye tracking. They have chapters on scan path analysis. They have chapters on, um, I think, single cell analysis in monkeys. Um, I think this has something on fMRI and EEG as well. Um, and they have a chapter on reading. So if you're just looking for something um, overarching, um, I really do think it's a good book and we put a lot of effort into it. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is a, really something that's super important that you spend a lot of time 
um, on the study design so that you typically spend a lot of time writing or just generally designing the stimuli and that you also have um, other people have a look at them um, to see if, if there's anything you missed because once you've collected the data you can't go back and fix it if you realize oh everybody missed, uh, interpreted the sentence in a completely different way from what I expected and this messes my messes up my um my design then you can't go back and change it so that's definitely something if you're interested in doing an eye tracking experiment um expect the um stimuli design or kind of writing or making the stimuli expect that to take quite a while <laughs> because that needs to be really well thought through before you start the experiment yeah. And run pilot studies. Get all your friends um, as your lab guinea pigs. Um, run enough pilot studies uh, before yeah. you start. Yeah. Also, th so the first time you use an eye tracker, it can be a bit overwhelming. Um, so it's also good to have things like, okay, what if people are wearing glasses? What if they are wearing contact lenses? These are all things that can make it a bit more difficult to get good tracking um, so that's definitely something that also takes a bit of time and is very necessary yeah. and one of the questions um, from earlier actually um, okay I think some uh, you just said um, is this typical seam strategic eye movement um, maybe I should clarify that they had um, 10 practice trials so they had two or three trials just with me um, saying, okay, do you understand what you have to do? Do you like just answering questions? And then they had 10 practice rounds without me giving any prompts. Um, and so they did have practice looking at the fixation outside the stimulus and then it comes and this, the stimulus itself is around seven seconds. Um, so if they have enough practice by the time you actually start your experiment with children, um, they aren't doing trial and error anymore. Uh, okay, yeah. should we move on? Yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so this is a simulation of um, DVS data set. So maybe you want to um, explain yeah. what's going on. Yeah, <laughs> again, we've um, narrowed down, I don't know, 50 variables to just what you need for today. Um, and this is AOI data as well. So here you see um, the AOI name is either grid um, or should be like grid or target words, I think. Um, we've removed response words as well, or fixation, thank you. Uh, target, fixa but, yeah. yeah. Fixation mm -hmm. is uh, the bit to the left where they start. Um, that's not exactly a part of the stimulus, but that's where they start. Then you have the target word, and then um, the target word is where they look at um, as the cue, and then they come down to the grid to actually find the word. Um, that's the trial number. The next column is the trial number. Um, there are 30 trials per participant, um, but I have only included correct data and um, already made some kind of checks and removed um, whatever were like noisy trials or noisy participants, so you may not always have 30 trials. Um, the stimulus is which stimulus was used for non-native German speakers or for not German speakers. Uh, Folia is just uh, the slide that was used. Um, Category, if it's I, then it's I data, the category group. And if it's information, it's the trigger line. So that's where um, the event started. So that's where the trial started. Um, then you have, um, yeah, the index is just like indexed um, according to which number of fixation it was or what um, event data it was. And then you just have event start time, end time, and um, duration, which I think we only have fixation data. Or do we? No, I think we have saccadic data as well. Um, yeah, so event or saccades, but um, uh, sorry, fixations or saccades, but I would recommend only using fixations. Um, and then you have start time, end time, and duration. And then finally, you have participants, and there should be 20 participants. I think, yeah. I think yeah. 22, but yes, yeah, oh, okay, you'll see it. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so it's based on my typically developing group, but it's simulated data. Okay. Um, maybe any questions on this before we move on? It's a seven sec. It's a two-second fixation followed by a seven-second um, 
stimulus. So that should be your rough time if you're looking for outliers and stuff. Okay, well then this is where we get to the kind of practical part. So um, we'll send you a link or maybe Divya has already yeah. sent it. Oh go. great, okay, so you have um, a data set that's called reading, reading data or something. So this is the one I showed. There's also one that's called sociodemographic data um, that just has, I think, age and gender of the participants. Um, and we also have a file for, so the one that we just showed. So we have this file as well. Um, so pick one of the two, or if you have lots of time and if you're really fast, maybe you have a look at both. But otherwise, just pick one, um, read it in, have a look, uh, see how you would prepare the data for visualization, um, come up with a nice visualization of your choice or two. Um, you can also try and running a model on the data, although I can tell you right now that for my, so for the reading data, it's not going to run. I mean, you can construct the model formula if you want, but it's going to complain because it's a small data set. Um, yeah, and we'll be here for, for questions or problems. Um, what I would say, though, is keep in mind a little bit that this is simulated data, so if something looks a little bit strange, um, if you've already seen eye tracking data and, and you think, oh, some of this is a bit weird, we just simulated it, so don't, don't, don't overthink it, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe we keep the prompts on, on um, because we are oh, yeah. short on This time. part as well? Yeah, there's this nothing. Uh, the only thing is visualizing data versus visualizing statistics is what I would focus on. Right now, you can only visualize statistics, so you can look at the data and then visualize, um, I don't know, mean fixation duration or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. But if you want to visualize Canvas, the one that I showed you um, was just from my software, from the SMI software. But the packages that we'll give you at the end um, do have um, possibilities to, to visualize Canvas as well. But that's not what we're doing today. Yeah. And what we also won't be doing really is um, statistical analysis. So this yeah. is also its own um, topic, really. If you're familiar, um, yeah. you can, if you want, construct um, a model, but it probably won't run. At least it didn't. Uh, it didn't run for me. Yeah. So maybe just um, fo kind of focus on um, wrangling the data, preparing it a bit, and visualizing it for yeah. today. Um, but like two more slides ahead. Always here, and we'll give some prompts if you exactly. want to. Um, and I think my prompts were just like what you could do is you could find the first fixation on target word. Um, that's easy enough. You could just you know try and find where at what time they had the first target word so that's called entry time and that's a typical eye tracking parameter and when you have areas of interest you can find the entry time to the target word entry time to the grid those were like two basic examples um, or you could try and find um, the mean time they spend looking at the target word that differs between people as well and you can see if there are any outliers so that's something yeah can... i think i found the slide i think yeah. that's the one you meant right yeah yes. <laughs> yeah and i am also posting um um all the eye tracking tools on our on our cran right now um there's a whole lot of uh tools there um but we'll discuss some at the end which um I think I've done the same. What was the target word? Um, so the target word is the word on top of the grid, the, the word you need to look for in the grid. Thank you. So just to make sure I'm clear, what we're supposed to be doing is we download the data from the link that you send from the WeTransfer, mm -hmm. and then we just load it into R and look at it with our standard um, tools like uh, Tidyverse, Base R, whatever you feel like. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if anybody in the chat is lost or doesn't have such a strong background in R, um, feel free to also message one of us privately yeah. if you don't feel like um, speaking speaking out. Yeah. We can, we can well, help. we can 
what we could also do is um, if somebody would like a more of a walkthrough and a bit more help with this, um, we could also set up um, breakout rooms. Definitely, yeah. So if anyone's interested, just let us know. And can you also just remind us, so we got three data sets here. What, what are they? So they're, one mm -hmm. of them is Julia's example data and the other one is Divya's. And then there's a third mm -hmm. one as well. The third one is um, just sociodemographic data that you can add to the reading data. So it just should have the participants um, ID, their gender and their age. So this is an optional one. You can add this to the reading data if you want to. few little pointers for the reading data. So if you're working with um, the other data, if you're already a pro, then just ignore me. But what you would typically do with, so just for the reading data, um, you can think about, do I need all the columns? So can I remove some of the variables because they're not interesting or because they're a repetition of information I have elsewhere? Um, and then also, do I need data for all the words, so for all the interest areas, um, or should I narrow it down to, to what I'm actually interested in? Um, you can also look at outliers, um, and you can, if you'd like to, uh, you can join this information, so the sociodemographic information, you can add it to the reading data, right? So just a few ideas um, of what you can do if you're feeling a bit stuck. Great, thanks. Can I ask you kind of a comprehension question? Sure. Um, I see that. So some some of the words have nothing in fix, first fixation or regression. Then yeah. is it true that the first word in the sentence has a fixed um, a first fixation number, but not a regression path duration number because it's the first word? Or why would some have um, fixation but not regression path? Mm -hmm. So if they have a fixation but no regression path, so if there's an NA in that, in the regression path, and that means they just looked at the word and then they moved on to the next one and they didn't look back, basically. So when you have a regression path, um, so when you have a number for the word doctor, for example, it means that they looked at doctor and then they also looked to the left and made a regression out of doctor to the left. Does that answer your question? Um, kind of. So the regression path, the word that they're regressing to, that information is not there, but it's, it's... No, exactly. It's the word that they're starting the regression from, right? So they would read the word and then start the regression out of the word to the left. Okay. So you can, that's also a variable that you can collect or that you can look at. It's just not in that data set. Okay. NA. So the NAs are just um, kind of full stops, which is not what R expects. So that would be the first thing that you can specify NA equals and then quotation mark, uh, quotation marks full stop, and then R will automatically replace that. Um, so just as a little helper. Um, and then I would actually narrow down the data, especially to um, the words we're actually interested in. For this experiment, that would just be the pronouns. So I would um, narrow the data just to to those rows. And then for plotting, um, you don't have to remove it um, because ggplot will just, it'll give you a little warning, but it will plot it fine. Um, and then for modeling, you would probably remove, um, you, you would remove NAs for, um, so when the person didn't look at his or her, you would remove that. Um, or you would have to specify it in the model formula. But the main thing um, for this experiment would be to just look at the data for his or her, because that's what that's where we're expecting something to happen depending on the condition. Yeah, yeah. is that clear? I would say the same for um, the visual data, the visual search data as well. Um, if you're just interested in the first question, where is the first fixation on target word, then just subset the target word and just 
doesn't matter what the rest is. So the NAs are in the first column, but if you just subset what you're interested in, um, I don't think there are any NAs. Also, you would want to remember um, if you're looking at the target word, for example, it starts two seconds after. So the first two seconds are the fixation cross. And so it gives you the area of interest in pixels, but it doesn't know that it needs to take that area after stimulus onset. So you'd have to filter it not just based on I need the target word, but I need the target word from two seconds on. Like I need to know if they looked at that area after two, the first two seconds. And it wasn't just an unconscious regression there during the fixation. Do you know what I mean? Is that clear? No. Yeah, no, yes, no. Okay. <laughs> so there is, not totally clear to me. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is the computer screen. Um, that's your spatial um, area. And now the spatial area for the first two seconds only has a fixation to the left. And after the first two seconds, it has a target word on top and a grid. Now the data, you're telling the software, I need this spatial area marked as the target word. But you're not saying that this area needs to be marked only after the first two seconds. So this needs to happen offline. So when you say I'm, I'm interested in the target word, you say I'm interested in the target word, but from two seconds on, because the first two seconds, I have a different area of interest. And that's something you need to know based on your experiment and your design. So for the data set that you gave us, we have to filter that there is no target duration that has a number below two? Yeah, I, I would say 1700 because once you form, um, or 1500, 1700, um, because if you know, like your brain knows it's going to come in two seconds, you may already go to that spatial area a few milliseconds before, and that's okay. Um, but you don't want, say, a residue from the previous trial to come into the next trial or something like that. So you need to filter that out as well. So I would say your first step is filtering out target words after 1700 or 2000 milliseconds. Yeah, so everything um, is generally measured in milliseconds, yeah. right? So, um, so 1000 milliseconds would be one second. Yeah, thank you. Um, important. Minutes mm -hmm. um, and what I'm putting on screen now is some pointers for the reading data. So if you're stuck, you can have a look. Um, I'm telling you kind of which commands, or I'm suggesting some commands that you can use so you can give that a go if you like. And we'll also show you some, some code, of course. And um, Yulia, how would you go about figuring out which points would be outliers? Mm -hmm. um, so you could just do something like a box plot or a violin plot. So a mm -hmm. um, little spoiler, there is one outlier that I kind of manually um, put in the data set that you can see if you if you make a visualization. And um, there are lots of there are lots of different techniques uh, for doing this. So you don't right now you don't have to get too fancy um, with it. You can just do it by visual inspection, you know, plotting it, having a look. Um, there are also ways of doing it by looking at uh, the standard deviation. So anything that's um, beyond something like two standard deviations. Um, uh, yeah will be removed. Um, sometimes you can also, so if it's um, a really unrealistically high number, especially, that might be an indication that the person wasn't really paying attention, maybe was getting tired and was just kind of staring blankly at the screen. Um, yeah, that's a bit of a philosophical question. Um, so for this, for this exercise, you can really just look at it and you'll see it pretty quickly, I think. Um, 
what we did with our simulated data just briefly or yeah i have some uh code in the slides that i can show and i think you have a script as well that yeah. you can so we can switch a screen so maybe i should start and quickly go through what i did yeah. and yeah so i'm suggesting um a couple of things um here so this is really very tight and um, focused because that's how to do things um so you need and uh, you use filter lots of different things um only interested in which would his and her in a very simple example uh, you could use it to remove outliers um, removing data points if the participants answered a question incorrectly you don't have to do that in this example because uh, this is only correct answers you didn't have that information or you didn't have the variable you can convert uh, the data types so converting to factors and so on and then if you like you can also join this additional sociodemographic information um, or Typically in reading experiments, you would look at word frequency. So how often does a word occur? Um, because words that are very frequent are read faster typically. Um, yeah. And so just to show you the code. Okay. So reading it in, um, I just added this little um, part here just to tell our NAs I expressed for some reason. Um, yeah, just read in the sociodemographic data then I got rid of these variables so I used we're not really interested in that um, data file is the same as the participant so um, also not very interesting and then I used filter to narrow it down just to interest areas that were his or her okay and then I also joined the two so I did a left join with um, this reduced reading data set with the sociodemographic data that I just read in. I didn't really do anything with that. And so the variable I want to join it by is participant. And in the sociodemographic data, it's actually called participant. Um, but in the eye tracking data, it's called recording session label. So this is just participant ID in both cases. It's named differently in the data set, which is why you have to do it with this by equals and then give it a list of this is the name of the variable in the first data set, so in this one, this is the name of the variable in the second data set, but they contain the same information, so please go join it by that um, variable. And then we end up with this um, data set, so you've already seen this, but now we only have his, his, her, and so on, right? So nothing else. Um, and we have this um, sociodemographic info just joined at the end as well. Oops. Okay. Um, and then I just did a really quick um, violin plot, um, which I like just because you can see the distributions, which look a bit weird because it's simulated and I didn't pay that, you know, super close attention um, to see whether the distributions on his and her would be would look normal. So don't worry too much about that. We can see that this is something I would um, probably get rid of as an outlier here for the first fixation durations. Yeah, so this is the first, the left one um, is the first fixation duration on his or her um, in the congruent condition compared to the incongruent condition. So again, the congruent condition would be the stereotype matches up with the pronoun doctor his, um, incongruent would be it doesn't match up doctor her, right? And then the right graph is the same, just with the regression path durations. Um, so, but this, the idea is, is the same. So regressions out of the pronouns, how long are they, is what we're looking at here. And then I removed the outlier for the first fixation duration, so we can see it a little bit better, right? Um, yeah, and then you can also do things like, Oh, I don't have the code, unfortunately, here, but it's just an added facet wrap um, gender, so that on the left you have data from the women, on the right you have data from the men, and this looks super similar. Um, yeah, overall, so to interpret this, um, I, I mean, I, I simulated the, the data in such a way that we get longer fixations um, in the incongruent conditions, also longer regressions, um, but there's a bit more variability in the regressions. So people 
in the simulated data react to this um, kind of contradiction, not really contradiction, but perceived contradiction um, more on or more reliably in terms of the fixation duration instead of regression um, is how you could interpret this. Yeah, so overall interpretation would be that these incongruent combinations, um, people find them more difficult to process. And then if you wanted to model this, but again, it, it complains, you would typically do a mixed effects model, uh, which is something that obviously we don't really have time in, in eight minutes to um, talk about, but you would typically have um, random slopes and random intercepts by um, participant and often also by item to see. So the basic idea is just to see if people, or to account for the fact that people might react differently um, so one person might might be really thrown off by these incongruent combinations and might have really different um, fixation durations and regression paths. Um, other people might um, have very small differences, right? So um, mixed effects models just very generally can take um, or can account for this individual level variation really well. And that's one of the reasons why we would often use it in eye tracking. Okay, so then I will stop sharing mm -hmm. and you um, can share yours. Share my screen. Um, I will do this really quick. <laughs> um, okay, so we just look at the data, we explore the data a bit, and what I did was not the idea was. <laughs> um, and <laughs> just um, subsetted first the target word and after 1700 milliseconds um, and then I did this again for the grid and I really like the aggregate function um, and you can use this to just take the lowest value so once you have all the target words that you could possibly have of interest and then you can just aggregate it to select the um, lowest target word like the minimum target word and that would be um, your first fixation on target. Um, and the same thing that I did like with aggregate and with mean. Um, sorry, did I hang again or can you hear me? No, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, yeah. I think Kyla hung. Um, okay, and um, so then I aggregated again and that's how you get the mean duration in grid. Um, for the outliers, you can also um, see that I made um, a density plot here. And you can see that. So that um, just shows you our trial ends here. So all of this is just something that the data simulated. Um, that doesn't make sense, or it can sometimes be that the, like, my system had this at the last trial, would just run till the system shut. Um, and so, you know, you need to like filter out these trials and see what's going on there. Were they, was it the last trial? Was it um, just something that's wrong with the data? And then if there are any outliers here, um, but otherwise it all looks good. And didn't want to get into too much details here, but this data, like the actual data is published. So if you want to see what the final figures look like for this data, um, That's like mean entry to Q, which is the target word. Um, and these are density plots for um, the four groups. And there are like a lot of these, um, like these plots that you can even find published now. So didn't want to get into too much detail there. Um, but yeah, that's what the visualization look like. And stop sharing again. So you can stop for a bit if you'd like to. Anyone have any questions, comments? So will you guys have these um, example scripts available on our GitHub? Uh, yeah, we'll put it all on GitHub. Great, okay. yeah. we can take a look. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so then all we the have left slide. is to, yeah, to show the, packages yeah so some of these packages i found out from um conferences like i said um 
Popeye seems to be good for um, pupil movement. Gaze path and gaze R for um, also scan paths. And eye tracking R also lets you set um, areas of interest offline, which I thought was quite cool. Um, but the link that I sent earlier on GitHub, which is here as well, has all the possible packages on CRAN right now that do eye tracking um, analysis, which is a lot. Uh, but filter through it and um, yeah, see what works for you if you need to, although I um, haven't used any packages till now in any of my papers. So it's all been base R and IDverse and around it. Yeah. Um, Trivia, where did you say uh, we can find the scripts? Uh, on GitHub. We'll put it all on GitHub yeah. in the next few days. Here in the R packages, you mean here also, we can find the scripts. You'll find the presentation on GitHub, so then you can find um, everything that we're talking okay. about and showing today. Okay, yeah, good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And the final slide is some books. Uh, the second one was already recommended here earlier. Um, and there are some, there's one on linguistics. Julia, you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, um, so this is just, so the first one, um, I don't know how many of you are, are linguists, um, but the first one is a really nice first introduction um, to eye tracking, especially for linguists. I think there's there's worth in reading it as a, as a non-linguist, just as a, a first introduction to eye tracking. Um, it doesn't go into a lot of details, so it's more of a, yeah, yeah, really just a first introduction, but it's really accessible. Um, and the links are mostly the um, sources for the pictures <laughs> that we use throughout the presentation. Okay, any final uh, uh, final questions? Oops. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you guys for having um, this 